Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to give like a cup, like a few seconds or about a minute for all the participants to to finish entering the the webinar. Um, because I see the number of participants increasing slowly. So about a minute uh, for everyone to to get in and then we will start. Okay, now the number of participants are uh, stabilized, so I'm going to uh, to start. So thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we have mixed feelings. We, for, on the one hand, we are very excited of being hosting the Bogotá Experimental Economics Conference once again. This is the fourth edition in Bogotá, but this is a conference that started um, in Antigua, organized by Diego Asinena and Lucas Wenschler uh, in 2012. And this is the ninth edition, if we, we take that into account. Uh, as you know, this is a conference that uh, aims to bring together uh, Latin American researchers and strengthen the tie of Latin American research with the rest of the world. And I think that we've been successful at do, uh, doing that. Um, we, we don't like that this has to be virtually this year. Uh, we really miss the, the interaction and uh, you are missing the opportunity of being in Bogota, which is a great city. Um, and we are going to miss a lot like conference dinners and coffee breaks that in the conference are always uh, so nice and lively. Um, but the advantage of, the, of this is that many of you wouldn't have come uh, for example, our keynote speaker uh, today, Cristina Vichieri, she's also always very busy and it's easier to steal one hour of her time or a couple of hours of her time than a couple of days for her to travel, etc. So we are going to, help to hold um, the keynote talks as webinars, but then the contributed sessions are going to be regular Zoom meetings. Uh, so the way that Christina's talk is going to work is a regular uh, keynote lecture in, in, a, in a conference. Um, Christina is going to talk for one hour and then we are going to open the, the floor for uh, questions. And since this is a webinar, questions are going to be through chat. So Diego Aicinena is going to be the moderator uh, and he will introduce Christina. So thank you everyone for being here. Uh, please stay after Christina's talk for the for the contributed sessions. You just have to switch links because that's going to be a regular Zoom meeting. Uh, Diego, the screen is yours. Thank you, Mariana. I have the pleasure and honor of presenting uh, Christina this year. Christina is the SJP Harvey Professor of Social Thought and Comparative Ethics at the University of Pennsylvania a professor of legal studies at Wharton, head of the Behavioral Ethics Lab, founder of the Penn Social Norms Group, among many other prestigious positions that she holds. Uh, she received her PhD from Cambridge University and a laurea uh, from University of Milano. Uh, Cristina brings an interdisciplinary approach in her research at the border between philosophy, game theory, and psychology. Her research interests and contributions are varied, and I could spend a long time referring to all of her contributions, but I'm sure everyone prefers to hear her give a talk than me talk about her contributions. Uh, I do want to highlight one of the areas of, of contributions. 
and that is the nature and evolution of social norms, how to measure norms, and what strategies to adopt to foster social change. Her approach and her contributions to social norms are of particular importance to economists and has been very influential, especially for experimentalists. At the most basic and fundamental level, she has brought conceptual structure and clarity to how we think of social norms. This is very important and it still needs to permeate the profession. We economists tend to be very demanding regarding the precision of the terms uh, we use. You know, don't dare to confuse uh, calling an action a strategy in, in strategic interactions because you will hear a lot about it. But we still need uh, more conceptual clarity that Cristina has put forth uh, when we talk and discuss uh, social norms. We economists have arrived late to studying the implication of social norms for economic behavior, so there's still uh, big room for improvement. Uh, without further ado, I give you Cristina Vicchieri. Cristina, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Diego. And thank you, Mariana. I'm very happy uh, to be in Bogota, <laughs> even if only on video. Uh, so today I want to talk uh, of something uh, that uh, is um, very much in the mind uh, of uh, policymakers, especially after you know the, the disaster of COVID-19. And the idea is, oh, we have to change people's behavior, how we can change people's behavior. And all the debate about changing behavior is very much related to what we call norm nudging. So let us talk a little bit about norm nudging, uh, the good and the negative about it. And then I will talk about some experiments that um, I have done and some I'm still doing that should clarify a few uh, issues related to this topic. Let me share the screen. Okay, do you see it? All right. Yes. Yes, we can yes. see it. Okay, perfect. So nudging is interesting because it's an idea that you can reframe the choice architecture in order to redirect behavior, uh, but without you know eliminating or forbidding options or using economic incentives in the sense of changing economic incentive, like using a fine, a negative incentive, or using a positive economic incentive. You don't need that. And uh, there are lots of examples uh, of the early norm nudging. And typically, these nudges are directed at individual behavior. Uh, for example, let's convince people to donate organs, and Austria has done a, a big program on that. Another very famous program is the Encourage, so-called the Encourage trial, in which you try, uh, you know, to keep people taking their medications. Uh, another, um, another issue has been how to automatically enroll people in 401k plans so that uh, they will save more for retirement. And, you know, some of these programs have been successful, some less so. But uh, what interested us today is uh, collective behavioral change. So it's very interesting to you to to use nudging to make you take your medicine on time or do gymnastic or keep dieting. But the important thing is basically, uh, you know, when we want to change collective behavior, what do we do? Now, to change collective behavior, nudging means informing people about either what other people do or don't do, so the frequency of certain behaviors, or whether other people approve or disapprove of the target behavior. And this is, is uh, the idea behind this is informing people about what other people do or uh, approve or disapprove of will induce behavioral change. So these not just work through what we call social comparison. Okay, for example, 
holds for the, the very nice study alerting taxpayers that the majority of people pay on time. And you have some experience of nudging, though maybe it was not called nudging at the time, in Bogota when uh, the mayor was Mocus, uh, when he hired mimes to give driving feedback to you know, city driver. And I remember there was a green thumb up, red thumb down. And again, uh, there was a lot of social comparison because people could see who got the thumbs. And uh, apparently they are telling me all, all drivers wanted the green up. <laughs> okay, so there was again, it was a social comparison, nudging mechanism. Now, what is the necessary assumption for norm nudging? It is that the target behavior are interdependent. Okay, so social nudging, collective nudging is, uh, presupposes, if you will, the idea of interdependence of behavior. What does it mean interdependence? And this has been all my work on social norm. It means that individual preference for performing the target behavior is conditional on their social expectation. So my preference for, you know, uh, driving uh, slowly, let's say, is conditional on my social expectation. In this case, is conditional on what I believe other drivers do, how they behave, and uh, what I believe uh, they appreciate, they approve of. So I define a norm nudge in a very specific way. So it's a nudge whose mechanism of action is based on eliciting social expectations, okay? On creating social expectation and with what goal? With the goal of inducing behavior that we deem desirable for society. Under a crucial assumption that the preference for performing the target behavior are conditional on social expectation because if they are not, it doesn't matter the nudge will fail. Now, which expectation do we want to induce or change? There are two types of expectations that matter. One I call empirical or descriptive, if you will, and the other is normative or injunctive. Empirical expectations are what we expect other people to do in the same situation, and normative are what we expect other people to approve or disapprove of, in the same situation where we are. Now, there are three things that are important for a nudge to be effective. Mechanism, motivation, context. First of all, we have to identify the mechanism through which this type of information affect behavior, okay? If we believe they affect behavior, well, what's the mechanism, okay? How do they do that? Second, we have to understand the motivation for specific behavior. It's not necessarily the case that people are motivated by what other people do or approve or disapprove of. We don't know, you know, at the start. And usually in my work, we do surveys to understand that. For example, we want to curb littering. Well, do people litter out of convenience? There are very few trash bins, you know, and very far from each other? Or do they litter because other people litter? So they see other people litter and they think, okay, is admissible, is okay, I will litter too. Well, in order to curb littering, you have to decide, this is a very simple example and trivial, but uh, you know, the kind of question we ask about motivation are very far from trivial. It's very important to know what motivates people to uh, behave in a particular way. And the third and very important is context. We have to understand the very specific context within which the target behavior occurs. Not understanding the context may lead us uh, to, you know, bad nudging, to say the least. Okay. Now, nudging is usually done, not always, but usually done 
conveying empirical information, okay? It has a descriptive flavor. Information about what other people do in the same situation. And uh, it has worked, but it also has failed. Now, for example, the typical example of nudging, of uh, collective nudging is uh, trying uh, to make people use less water or less electricity. And what you do, you compare electricity consumption to the consumption of the neighbors, okay? So the neighbors are sort of your reference network, you know, the people that may matter to your use uh, of more or less electricity. And in fact, uh, Alcott's study showed a reduced consumption. Now, a parenthesis, I have, you have to be aware that these are not longitudinal studies. What do I mean? That in order to verify the intervention has really been successful, you know, you have to look across time whether people continue okay, reducing electricity consumption or not. And these uh, uh, we really, in most cases, do not know. Uh, another example is uh, water consumption in California. Now here, there is a very nice paper by Sion Bannott in which uh, he paired information about the neighbors, you know, how much they consume compared to me, let's say, uh, with an injunctive message, a little drop that is, uh, is variably happy or sad or neutral and consumption at least temporarily was reduced. Another nice example is, uh, you know, when you go to a hotel very often in the US at least, uh, you know, there is a, a little card uh, that pleads with you uh, to reuse the towels to save water. And um, we know, you know, there is a, a great, uh, Goldstein did uh, a great uh, uh, experiment in which they show that uh, the closer the reference network is to you, the more, the better you will behave. So if you give a general uh, message about hotel guests do X, Y, Z, people will respond uh, um, in a less favorable way than the message saying, uh, to the message saying, oh, hotel guests in your room, 325, <laughs> have reused towels and people will reuse more. Now, however, the message, what you say, is very important, okay? So, for example, when you compare electricity usage to the usage of neighbors, you can just give an average, but that's a problem. And there is a very famous paper by Schultz and, and others that exactly used uh, the average, the idea of average consumption, and what happened? Well, people below average started consuming more. They went toward the average and people above started consuming a little, little less. However, uh, there was no overall change in electricity use. So again, it's very important to be aware of the quality and the wording of the message. Now, there are many reasons why nudging using empirical information may fail, okay? First of all, you may not understand very well the reference network, okay? For example, the message to the hotel guest, what is the reference network? I may think, well, if uh, you tell me that other hotel guests in the US behave in a certain way, okay, so it's a very generic, reference network, I may think, uh, okay, they are staying uh, in lower level hotels and they do that, but in my hotel, probably they don't. And so I will, <laughs> I will give a self-serving interpretation, an interpretation that allows me not to reuse the towels because I am in a luxury hotel, let's say. Okay, if, if it is guests in my room, is much more clear who the reference network is and people respond in a more positive way. A great example of the right use of a reference network is a whole sort study of general practitioners 
in, uh, uh, in the UK, where he informed that those GPs that overprescribe antibiotics, they informed them that they, that they overprescribed more than 80% of the GPs in their area. This is very important, in their area. Okay, otherwise, there are lots of reasons why I may think this guy prescribed less, okay, and keep prescribing a lot of antibiotics. So it was very successful and it reduced antibiotic, antibiotic prescription. Another reason, so reference network, be clear about that. The second, uh, the second uh, issue is trust. The messenger may not be trusted or credible. And uh, uh, in conjunction, and if there is time, I will talk a little bit about that with Enrique Fatas and others. We have done a very interesting experiment in nine different countries, and Colombia was one of them, uh, in which we show that norm nudging may be, you know, uh, in principle successful, but if there is no trust in the message, in this case, the scientific message, behavior uh, will not be what we expected, okay? So messenger, the message me, me should be trusted, should be credible. And last but not least, uh, people tend to reject information that is inconsistent with their beliefs. Now we see that with fake news, you know, people, uh, you know, absorb fake news, um, why? Because, uh, for a because of a confirmation bias, because you know, it confirms what they already believe. And uh, if we give them different information, even if we give them statistic, I'm doing an experiment as we, as we speak about that, people do not seem to be very sensitive to that if they have already an uh, ideological, ideologically motivated belief. So, People reject information that is inconsistent with their beliefs, so watch out about that. Now, what about giving people simply normative information, okay? Giving people information what's good or bad or what other people approve or disapprove, okay? And it is very unclear whether these messages, when you give only a normative message, an injunctive message, if this message is uh, uh, successful or not, is effective or not. So we know that some messages for water conservation were effective. Again, we don't have the longitudinal analysis, so, but in the short run, they were effective. And uh, Cialdini has a famous example with littering in which, uh, you know, you are in a littered environment, a litter garage, and you have a flyer in your hand and you don't know what to do with it and uh, you know you want to throw it away but on the flyers there is a sentence about uh, you know either recycling or very directly about not littering and apparently this message uh, temporarily at least works and uh, Schultz also uh, you know tried to remedy his average message by adding normative information. And, uh, you know, apparently it worked. It remedied the bad effect. Problem, when the normative and the empirical are incongruent, so the empirical message, the empirical information you have tells you that people do X, but the normative tell, tells you you should not do X. What do people do? And uh, I have uh, a very early paper in 2009 uh, with Ertek Xiao. We exactly asked this question. What happens when messages are incongruent? And uh, unfortunately, we show that the empirical information is much stronger than the normative one. And this is a little bit the topic of my uh, subsequent discussion today. It is also true that the normative message, an injunctive message, not just what other people approve of, but you know, sometimes messages say what is right to do, the good thing to do is blah, blah, blah. Well, 
people often um, do the right, uh, the sorry, the wrong, wrong kind of inference from that. So if you need to tell me what the right thing to do, it means uh, you know that most people don't do it, and so this may be, you know, an inducement to misbehave. And we should see that in a moment. Okay. So how norm nudging can backfire? You know, we we are full of good intention. We do norm nudging. It doesn't work. First of all, think of the reference network problem. The information may allow what Jason Dana called the moral wiggle room. Okay, so is ambiguous and therefore I can interpret it in the most selfish way. Okay, in a way that benefits me and justifies my opportunistic behavior. Second, very important, if we mention be the truth, a high frequency of negative behavior, okay, we are normalizing it. And this is a problem with lots of corruption campaigns. They let people know the frequency, which is usually very high, of corrupt behavior. Well, this normalizes it, okay? And third, and most important, we draw asymmetric inferences from different type of information. So if the information is about what people do, we draw one particular inference about their approval. If I am told what people approve of or disapprove of, I draw a much weaker inference actually about what people in fact do. So what does it mean here? It means three things. One, if negative behavior is common, okay, and the empirical information makes this very clear, people will infer that it is approved, is okay. You know, that people really don't care. Second, that if we let people know that certain negative behavior is mostly disapproved by people, people will not infer that they don't do it. So disapproval does not imply that the positive behavior is common at all. Third, that if empirical and normative information are in conflict, the empirical usually wins. Okay, so let's talk about some recent experiments that deal a little bit with the, all these issues. So with the demand and Sonderegger, uh, we did uh, an experiment looking at whether uh, people, uh, you know, choose self-serving beliefs because, you know, let's face it, we choose what to believe, okay? And therefore how to behave. If we do it more often when faced with empirical versus normative information, okay? And the idea is let's provide people with information about an uncertain state of the world. So they have to sort out what's really happening. And the idea is, well, it may lead to belief distortion. Okay. And the conclusion is that belief distortion is facilitated by the asymmetry between normative and empirical information. And let's see the experiment. Okay. Now, the experimental design is a modification of uh, the Fischbacher and Formi Hoise uh, die under the cup paradigm. Okay, so uh, you it's completely anonymous. Uh, you toss, you know, a die, and uh, if number, let's say, if number five comes out, you get a price, and if any other number comes out, you get nothing. And I, the experimenter, can verify. Uh, what you saw and what you tell me, so there is a ample opportunity to lie. Now, all the participants were uh, provided, and I show you what we did, um, uh, beliefs about an uncertain state of the world, okay? Whether most people lie, 
or a proof of lying in the experiment, and then they can roll a die anonymously and report the outcome. Now, the variation of the experiment is whether participants knew in advance that they will have to follow through with the die under the cup experiment or not. Okay, so participants, when they uh, decide what to believe, and I come to that in a moment, uh, some will know that then they will do the die under the cup experiment, so they know they will be able to cheat, and others, in fact, do not. And so what are the uncertainty conditions? Uh, so people are divided uh, into uh, basically four groups. Okay, the two, two groups, one is normative uncertainty, the other is empirical uncertainty. And then for each of these groups, there are those who know they will play the die under the cup game afterwards. And uh, the other group doesn't know they will do that. Okay, let's look at what they see, normative uncertainty condition. I tell you, please read the following statement and determine whether you believe them to be true or false. Which one is true? And uh, if you tell me which one is true, because I have, uh, of course, the data from previous experiment, so we know, uh, you get like a price. In a similar study, most people said it is acceptable to lie for your own benefit, or in a similar study, most people said it is not acceptable to lie for your own benefit. Which one do you think is true? People exposed to the empirical uncertainty condition, instead, they have to decide which of these two statements is true. And again, we have data from the previous experiment. In a similar study, most people lied for their own benefits, or in a similar study, most people did not lie for their own benefit. Only one of these obviously is true. Tell me which one, if you're right, you win a prize. Okay. Now, look what happens. Look at the uh, first uh, belief elicitation, the first two tables there. Uh, it's very interesting. Now, the black dot is uh, um, here to the left, we have the empirical information and what sort of belief uh, you have, you decide is the true one, uh, receiving the empirical information. And here to the right, instead, which belief you think is right, receiving the normative information. And uh, the, the black dot is uh, the people who receive the information and know, already know, they will have to play uh, the dice game. And the blue point instead is the people who have to say what they believe, but they don't know that they subsequently play the game. And as you see, almost 63% up there of people who know that subsequently they will play the game, decide that the true belief is the majority lied, okay? While only 47% says so. So a majority here, a significant majority in that condition says, yeah, I think the true belief is the majority lied. <laughs> and those that don't know they have to play the game say, no, uh, you know. It's almost 50-50, but it's less than 50 actually. It's 47%, say the majority lies. So there is a significant difference, okay, in the belief reported by people who know they will be able to lie afterwards and people who don't know they will play the game afterwards. Now, what happens instead to the people that are asked about, you know, what's the truthful normative belief? no change, okay? So uh, what? how many people believe that it is true that the majority approve of lying? Very few, okay? 
those that know they will have to play the game afterward, only 38% and 36.4% of the other. So really no significant difference. So there is really no manipulation of the normative message, but there is manipulation of the empirical message. And you see that. And you see that also with behavior, but let's concentrate on why people manipulate more effectively the empirical, but not the normative message. Okay, so we follow up this experiment with two variations. Uh, we, we did a survey in which we gave other groups, of course, either empirical information, and then we elicit the normative expectations. For example, we say the met we explain the game, of course, and then we say the majority of participants did not lie for their own benefit. How many of them disapprove of lying? The other group is given normative information and will elicit empirical expectation. The majority of participants disapproved of lying. How many did not lie for their own benefit? Look at the result. This is a situation when we give the empirical information, okay? And uh, the empirical information is the majority did not lie. And then we ask, well, how many did lie? Uh, how many, sorry, uh, approved of lying? So empirical, they did not like how many approve of lying. And here, the overwhelming majority is said, no, no, they didn't lie, they disapproved of lying. Okay, they totally disapprove of lying if they did not lie. Look at the normative story. Okay, here in this group, he said the majority disapprove of lying. How many did lie? Well, it's 50-50, really. Okay, so uh, <laughs> in English, we say uh, uh, walk the talk or words and deeds are two completely different things. So when you see something being done, Okay, you believe uh, that there is uh, approval for doing that. Okay, people agree to do that. People believe it's okay to do that. But when people tell you it's okay to do that, you don't immediately infer that they will do that. And this is very important. Now, I followed this uh, experiment uh, with uh, another experiment on norm inference. Okay, what is norm inference? Which is very important in norm nudging because norm nudging, you give a message and people should infer something from that message. So norm, norm inference is the reasoning process in which an individual derives the information about a social group from a very summary representation of their behavior or their beliefs, okay? And with a student of mine, I did uh, an experiment in which we show three things. First of all, that across behavioral domains, there are differences in norm inference. Second, the norm inferences differ by the type of the social expectation that you elicit. And we have seen a little bit of that, empirical or normative, but also that this effect is modulated or even moderated by the valence of the behavior. So whether the behavior is positive or negative. Now, how did we do this experiment? Participants were randomly assigned to judge the approval rates, okay? Either the approval rates or the prevalence, but the approval rates of a behavior among residents in an hypothetical city after receiving some empirical information about how common, how frequent is a certain behavior. Let's say most people donate to charity and how many people do you think approve of donation of charity? This is the first thing. Or you're asked to judge the prevalence, the frequency of a behavior after receiving information regarding the endorsement of this behavior. So most people think it's appropriate to donate to the charity. How many people you think donate to the charity? Okay, so the, the experiment uses a two by two 
factorial between subject design and randomize the order of 23 different behavior for each participant. So each participant had to answer, you know, in random order about 23 different behavior. And each participant were randomly assigned to one of four conditions. Empirical positive, so you receive empirical information about a good behavior. Normative positive, empirical negative, normative negative, okay? There is a vignette uh, narrative, okay? Now you enter a world travel machine, you land in a city, randomly selected, you will receive information about what the residents do or what residents believe in this city, tell us what you infer from the information about what in fact they think is appropriate or they do. And we use a slider that goes from zero to 100 to indicate, you know, uh, what you infer. No one does, everybody does, or 50% do, or nobody approves, 50% approve, 100% approve, okay? Now, I give you an example, speed driving. So different people receive one of these uh, particular, sorry, uh, vignette, okay? The empirical positive condition in this new city most resident drive below the speed limit. How many do you think say it is appropriate and so on and so forth. Now, this is very important. Uh, this is crucial. So here we have the effect of the type of information, empirical normative, okay? We have a box plot here, okay? And the valence of the behavior. So here, when I say positive norms is good behaviors, right below the speed limit, do not bribe public officers, et cetera, et cetera. And to the right here is negative norms, is negative behaviors, okay? And what this box plot show in general, that people have a higher inference rating in the positive versus the negative condition, okay? Across behavioral domain, okay? So if the behavior is positive, whether the descriptive or the normative, okay, the inference rating is higher than if the behavior is negative in both uh, empirical and normative. One thing that we notice is that norm inference rating, there is a much higher variance, look at the larger box plot, <laughs> uh, when the behavior is negative. But the most interesting thing, uh, is this right-hand side, okay. So the blue is the empirical information and the red is the normative. And you see that when we talk about positive behavior, okay, so in the positive condition, the estimated norm inference rating from giving them the empirical information is much higher than the estimate inference from the normative information. What does it mean? That if I tell you most people drive below the speed limit, you will infer, yes, most people approve of driving below the speed limit. But if I tell you most people approve of driving below the speed limit is the second, you know, the red dot, uh, the inference that people then will do that is weaker, is a weaker signal. The normative signal is weaker than the empirical one for the positive. What about the negative? If I tell you most people bribe public officer, versus most people approve of bribing public officers. Here, the, the strength of the inference is reverse, okay? Then the estimated norm inference rating from the empirical information most people bribe 
is lower than from the normative. So it, it is a stronger signal for a negative behavior to say that people approve of it, but they approve they do it, okay? Then, you know, okay, people do it. Does it mean they approve of it? Less so, very interesting. So it's different, really different inferences. And many behaviors that we study follow this pattern. So the empirical information for the positive is stronger than the normative inference wise. And in the negative condition with negative balance, negative behavior, the, uh, the relationship is reverse. Now, there are outliers. For example, an example we gave, uh, which was very discussed uh, in the US newspaper is parents who bribe uh, the uh, officers, uh, the admission officers at prestigious universities to have their kids admitted. Or, you know, sexual harassment or jaywalking or vaccination. Now in all these cases, uh, um, the, uh, the type of relationship uh, looks very different with bribing uh, basically is the same, okay? They, there is no difference in the inference that they draw either in the positive case or the normative case. And uh, jaywalking is very similar for harassment. Uh, you know, the inferences are always stronger for the normative information than from the empirical. And for vaccination, they are the same for the negative, but instead with the positive, uh, uh, there is a difference. Now, the, the, the issue is uh, why so? And what we found is the pattern of norm inference is context dependent, highly context dependent. What does it mean? It means that uh, uh, the outliers can be explained by observability, the frequency, the real frequency of that behavior and the level of agreement among responders. With vaccine, for example, there is a lot of disagreement. There is a lot of polarization. There are vax, no vax. And so we can explain that result. But to give you just one example, uh, bribing uh, you know, officer to get into college or even bribing government to obtain a contract, the commonness of this behavior, even if people say, oh yes, you know, I would do that, is conditional on uh, how many people are financially capable of doing that, okay? And therefore responded might think that bribing, let's say college officers or government officials is uncommon because you, know, you need a lot of money to do that. And so infer that less people actually do that, okay? In, even if people say it's appropriate, they don't infer then most people do because most people cannot do that, okay? So outliers can be explained uh, in this relatively simple way. So summarizing this, there is a double asymmetry in norm inference. Empirical information about positive behavior leads to a parallel normative inference. They do, they approve. Normative information about negative behavior leads to parallel empirical inference. They approve of cheating, then they cheat, okay? And so there has been uh, Erickson in particular describe the mental association of common with acceptable. And indeed uh, we show that this is the case, but you know, uh, making very specific what, if it is positive, is negative, etc. Also, our findings suggest that the direction and strength of this association is modulated by the valence of the behavior, good or bad. When the behavior is good, it's positive, they follow, people follow, common is acceptable, heuristic, when they make an inference. When the behavior is negative, the strength of the association between common and acceptable is completely reversed. And people infer other bad behavior to a greater prevalence from their normative attitudes. We have seen that, okay. Now, this is interesting and troubling. 
what happens if we observe, if we know that negative behavior is relatively frequent? If we know that there is corruption all around, that people bribe police officers and whatnot. And uh, since receiving information about behavior make it common, acceptable, this will produce an extra cascade of bad behavior. Now, how do we mitigate the effects of the erosion of non-compliance, of the erosion of potentially good behavior? And we demand Gacker and Nozenzo, we did a paper in which we do an experiment on the dynamic and erosion of non-compliance. And the, uh, the setup is repeated and non-strategic. So you can give uh, to a charity, you have a certain amount of money, the game is repeated. Every repetition you have, let's say $10 and the charity has $10, so you have to decide, leave it as is, or take some money from the charity or give some money to the charity, okay? And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, there are several conditions. In one condition, you don't see what your peers are doing. You know, you repeat the game with the same people, but you don't know what they are doing. In another condition, you see what they are doing, what they do. And in a third condition, which is the most interesting one, okay, is, uh, uh, I call it SP observation, that is observation with social proximity. Uh, in this case, you are told something uh, about how similar to you, your peers, the people who are playing with you in this game are with respect to a very simple and, if you will, an interesting thing, you know, we ask them uh, about, uh, uh, you know, a sport team and a victory of a sport team in Philadelphia. So people who know that probably are fans of, uh, of that team, people who don't probably are not. Nothing. Incredible. Now there is a lot of work on group identity and how group identity changes behavior. And uh, we know that uh, uh, by Tashfeld Turner, who was the great social psychologist in England, who started uh, the, the study of social identity. And we know that if you identify with a group, you will conform more to what you think is appropriate group behavior, group behavior, and you'll be very averse to inappropriate behavior. And economists Akerlof and Cranton in 2000 wrote a very nice paper about that. And again, social proximity in our case is knowledge about the Philadelphia sports team. Okay. And we did a separate uh, normal citation survey that you know we wanted to, to be sure that in people's mind that there is really a norm of giving and indeed there is a norm of giving or at least not taking is expected and approved behavior okay and look at what happens here is normalized to zero uh, the black is what happens in 20 repetition if people have no information about their peers, okay? There is, uh, of course, a decrease uh, in contribution, but nothing tremendously dramatic. Instead, the terrible descending line is uh, the pure observation. So when people observe other people and uh, they observe uh, other people usually taking, you know, a lot of people take, you know, then their behavior becomes worse and worse and worse. The interesting observation is this middle line, which is very similar in some sense to the black line, to the new observation, and this observation with social proximity. So social proximity reduces the bad effects of observing bad behavior. And the question is why? Now, uh, the, no, I, I don't want to spend hours here, but what we show is that when you observe peers, 
you will be sensitive to both bad and good behavior. And so there will be a balance and in this balance, a norm will survive, okay? And uh, we also show that identification matters a lot. What do we mean? There can be a, a cohesive and non-cohesive group. So one group may, all of them, and they know about all of them, they really do not know, you know, about, uh, uh, in this case, the Phillies victory in Philadelphia. They are all homogeneous in not knowing, okay? So the identification is less strong if they all know. And indeed, you know, uh, sorry, okay. A cohesive group here is a different story, it's this one, okay. Here is the strongest uh, identification. Here is, uh, these are the people, the black line is, uh, they don't know about, you know, the Phillies. They all not know. And here they all know about the Phillies. And this is a strong identification, okay? If we all know, we know we're sports fun, we know we will like the Phillies, and people make a lot of other inferences about the preference and the character of the people who are very similar to them in this evidently important respect fandom. And if you think the change in the charity box, you know, these people behave really well. And this much, much better than the people who are homogeneous, but, you know, not really caring about the feelings. And then I want to look something else, generic identification. Cohesive group, okay, those who respond well or those that don't know the answer, still do better than mixed group, okay, where there are heterogeneous answers. So A is very important to be cohesive, okay, but B, is very important to be cohesive in the important way. We all know when the Phillies won, you know, their cup. This is very important. Okay. So how, do, how what we can conclude about that is that the observation of bad behavior, even a little bit bad behavior drives erosion of non-compliance because individuals tend to react more to norm violation and less to norm compliance in general. However, when we introduce some measure of group identity, very important, and experiments can be done about that, okay? So group identification, the appropriate reference network can be a great tool to induce prosocial behavior because what happens when all these people here, okay, know that they are other members, you know, they are four, the other, the other three, I know the other three members are like me, they are fans of the Phillies. I see that, you know, sometimes we misbehave, but overall, we put also a lot of weight on good behavior. So, the group identification, the appropriate reference network is a great tool to induce prosocial behavior. Now, going back to norm nudging, norm nudging should make sure that the target group is cohesive, cohesive and able to observe example of good behavior. This is crucial to norm nudging, okay? Now, the last, uh, the last issue, I, I don't have much time, but uh, I want to report the result of an experiment I did with Enrique Fatas and others. And uh, it was uh, an experiment we, we did to understand, you know, whether nor nudging would be really uh, a good idea uh, to curb bad behaviors, to induce good behavior, during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
and we look at social distancing and staying at home. And the idea is uh, a driver for compliance is to create new social norms of good behavior. And how do you create them? Well, giving people good empirical and normative expectation about behavior. You know, the, this influences their decision to comply. And uh, the big question is, uh, well, will not norm nudging uh, be successful? And our answer is, unfortunately, <laughs> so and so, norm nudging can be successful, quite successful, if there is trust in science. You remember I told you about norm nudging, one importance is uh, trust in the message or the messenger? Well, in this case, you know, this is a public health message. So science is important. People have to believe what the doctors or the scientists say. If there is no trust in science, even the most fantastic norm nudging will not work, okay? And uh, we did uh, a survey in nine countries. Colombia was one of them. We did China, South Korea, in Asia, Colombia, Mexico, in Latin America. Uh, the US, of course, and then Germany, Italy, Mexico, uh, sorry, Germany, Italy, uh, Spain, and England, United Kingdom. Okay. And uh, uh, people were given a vignette. And in the vignette, you know, you, uh, you are told somebody like you lives in a very similar country affected by COVID. And then most or few, depending, residents are practicing social distancing, staying at home, and most or few uh, believe that one should practice social distancing and staying at home. So we give both empirical and normative information. They be conflicting, they be the same. And you see uh, that you ask people, how likely is this person, you know, to comply with social distancing? And when we give high empirical and normative expectation, this is, you know, the highest. And there is a super high correlation between staying home and social distancing. So I may talk of just one of them. And these, uh, you know, significantly descends. <laughs> and when low expectations, the expectations are low, it's much, much lower, the prediction that on a scale of one to 10, that they will comply uh, with the rules. And now, this is the vignette of social distancing. I don't show you, uh, you know, we all also ask people, um, you know, uh, a self-assessment. What did you do before the lockdown, after the lockdown? And actually, uh, you know, it's a robustness test for the vignette and it passed the test. You know, they are not significantly different. But what we look here is we look at the two extreme, low, low, low normative, low empirical, high, high empirical, high normative. And you see that uh, the social distancing and staying at home is the same. So I should show only this is much, much higher when expectations are, you know, uh, are high. So you might, you might infer here, Okay, let's create this expectation. Let's give people this expectation. Let's do norm nudging and they will behave well. Okay. Now the question is, are these high expectations sufficient to guarantee a high level of compliance? And uh, we immediately thought, okay, uh, these expectations, uh, even if we create them, you know, will interact with trust in science and maybe also with trust in government because government, after all, gives us uh, information about what's going on and what should be done. Christina? Yes? Just to give you a heads up, you have five more minutes. Okay. Uh, basically, what we show here is that the trust in government and science, in particular trust in sciences, is absolutely crucial. And you see that the US has the lowest of all on a scale of one to four. And what I want to show you is just this slide, okay? And in this slide, uh, the uh, orange part, uh, let, me, let me go, sorry. Okay. The orange part is people who trust science very little. And the khaki part is, 
people who trust science a lot. Okay, and you see that trust in science maximizes compliance for people who have high expectations. Okay, what we see on the contrary, the trust in science uh, uh, with low expectation doesn't matter a lot, but with low expectation, trust in government matter more. But the most important thing that we show here is that if you do norm nudging, okay, you have to be very careful because even if we induce high level of expectation of normative and empirical expectation, all this result will be negated by trust, by low trust in science. This is very, very important. The government should produce, should induce high trust in science. And I think that as a general conclusion, uh, is uh, that norm nudging can be very effective when behavior is conditional on empirical and on normative expectation, that the effectiveness depends on avoiding uncertainty, choosing the right reference network, using trusted messengers for convict information, and giving public examples of positive behavior. And I conclude here. And we can discuss what I said. Thank you very much, Cristina. This was a wonderful talk. Uh, we have some questions. Uh, Rafael Nunes Teixeira, uh, he says, you mentioned three factors associated with the power of norms and behavioral change. But can you say anything about personality factors that affect the role of norms and behavioral change? It seems that nonconformity and positive negative reciprocity might play an interesting factor in which type of individuals are affected by the norm. Well, certainly, certainly, uh, you know, there are personality types <laughs> that might be particularly resistant <laughs> to conform. But uh, usually uh, the data we have uh, is that, you know, People really are rule followers. I'm doing some other experiment uh, with um, uh, Gachter, Z Simon Gachter and Nozenzo, exactly about that. And uh, they had already some very interesting data. Even if it is a stupid rule, <laughs> you know, uh, people tend to, uh, the rule in the sense that they see what other people do, uh, they will tend to, uh, uh, they will tend to conform, uh, even if there is uh, a monetary loss doing that, which is very interesting, not a big monetary loss, of course, but people are rule followers. That's how we learn language, following rules. We would never learn to talk otherwise. <laughs> so Sander Onderstal has another question. He says, the norm in experiment, in experimental economics is not to deceive experimental participants. How does the researcher identify effects of information about others' behavior and beliefs while avoiding deception? Well, the experiment uh, I provided uh, um, with uh, um, Demand and Sander Egger is interesting because we do not deceive at all, okay? Uh, what we do is uh, give uh, uh, a state of uncertainty, okay? And, uh, you know, we ask them which one is true. One is true, of course. And then we see people that know that they will be able to cheat afterwards. They exactly choose the information that best allows them, basically, gives them a justification to cheat. Well, everybody cheats or majority cheats, etc. So there is absolutely no, um, uh, you know, uh, no cheating the, uh, the people that we experiment on, okay, when we give them uncertain information, etc. Uh, there is no cheating uh, for example, with being uh, ambiguous with the reference work. We have another experiment with Ertex Yao. Uh, we are publishing it soon on Jibo. And it is an experiment in which basically uh, we are a little model about the reference network, you know? There are people with low cost and high cost, just to give you an example. 
and uh, we say most of these people do X, Y, Z, but we don't say it's low cost or high cost. And what we see in subsequent experiments is that people think that, uh, you know, this is not really a clear cut reference network and they interpret the information, this is for low cost. Okay, I won't follow it. And again, we have not cheated people. We are not, we did not tell, we give an average. Okay, but when you give an average, it could be A or it could be B and people can, of course. So you can see people manipulating information without telling a lie. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, Rosemary Nagel uh, asks, uh, I think oh. re related to the, to the latest study. So scientists have replaced religion? <laughs> Rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, mark my words, all these uh, big problems like uh, climate change, where we want okay, to induce better behavior, okay, are all areas where people have, in some sense, to believe what the scientists say. If they don't, forget it. Now, what's the difference between science and religion? Huge difference. Science live in a realm of uncertainty, okay? <laughs> people have to tolerate uncertainty in order, you know, uh, to pick track of science and believe in science. So believing in science means you know, you believe that these scientific beliefs that are beliefs, they are not full truths because science changes, okay? I, they are well supported at the moment. And so I will take them into account. With the religion, religion, you know, especially people, you know, more traditional uh, religious beliefs is truth, you know, it's not a belief. Okay, so there is a huge difference between science and religion in the sense that science is always uncertain. There is uncertainty and you have to be able to tolerate uncertainty to believe in science. Carlos Kong asks, do you believe it is possible to use social norms to change confidence in science? And if I may add to that, do you think it's possible to use social norms to change how we do science, to make it more open, transparent, more uh, replicable? Um, the second, uh, yes. The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, you know, the problem is that there are lots uh, of um, incentives uh, not to work on uh, replicating experiments because uh, you get published for something new. Uh, you know, for something astounding, oh, I discover this reaction, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, you know, there is no price for replicating other people's experiments. And maybe show oh, yes, okay, they don't pan out, so what? <laughs> okay, so uh, the system of incentives is obviously, uh, you know, skewed towards, uh, you know, non-replication, basically. Okay, this is, is a very important, uh, very important thing. And uh, well, now things are changing. For example, um, uh, there is, uh, a, there, are, there are ways to make uh, our work better. Like for example, um, you put all your data, you know, you make all your data visible. They are on a website and people can go and look at the data and check the data, uh, which was not so e easily and, uh, usually done in the past. In science, this is normally done in hard science, but not in economics or, uh, you know, social science in general, psychology especially. And, uh, you know, so making uh, replicability, you know, an important thing. Well, let's look at the results. Let's see if they pan out or not. Uh, and um, another thing is, uh, you know, which is sort of gaining ground, uh, you know, uh, putting up your hypothesis, okay, uh, before you do the experiment. So you don't change the hypothesis on the basis of, oh, I got this, okay, my hypothesis was that, but, uh, you know, you put them forth, you say, I have this, 
uh, this model, I have this hypothesis, and then you know I do the experiment and see what happens. So there are tools uh, that we can use. I gave you just two simple examples uh, to change a little bit the norms, okay, of how to do in experimental science in this case. Uh, now, the first question is more difficult, you know, how to make people uh, believe science. One thing that can be done and should be done and uh, we saw it was not done in the US and in Brazil, for example, the government, in particular the president, very actively um, downplayed the scientific message. Well, of course, this is very damaging, okay? So the idea is that all these messages should go together. The government should support the scientific message, not put it down, okay? As simple as that, but very effective. Francesco Bogliacino has another question. You mentioned that the role of the belief in science as a mediator, is it possible that telling people what science uh, says works as a sort of normative expectation because of the authority, the authority of scientists? Uh, well, uh, that's uh, exactly um, what we studied. Uh, we uh, studied, uh, on average, of course, uh, is, uh, the, the number we, I gave you are averages, uh, trust in science. Trust in science is mean, uh, for example, with COVID-19 uh, is uh, what uh, virologists are telling us, you know, about what this virus is, you know, what are the consequences of doing or not doing certain things, certain behavior and so on and so forth. And uh, the problem is, uh, again, um, that uh, people for some reason may not believe this message. And again, if you have a government that goes against it, of course, they will believe even less, okay? But think of the old debate about uh, vaccination and the huge number of people, the Novax people. Okay, and you can understand that there is a lot of polarization on these, uh, on these issues. And there is also a lot of polarization on global warming. A lot of people do not believe that global warming is produced, you know, uh, partly at least produced by us, by what we do. They don't. And, uh, you know, the problem is, uh, uh, is a scientific message uh, enough? No, obviously it's not enough, but the problem is, the government, it should be the task of the government, okay, to engage public discourse on what science says, okay, and not downgrade it or, you know, uh, dismiss it. This is very important. Then there will always be polarization, I tell you. <laughs> but, uh, but probably there will be, they will open at least more discussion about these things. Since we still have time and uh, no questions, let me interject one of, of my own. In the study you were showing us uh, a little bit earlier uh, yeah. with the empirical and normative expectations with positive and, and negative balance, uh, where you found some exceptions uh, related to, to bribing. Do you think that could be due to the fact that, uh, you know, when bribing either for a position in college or for a, a contract, that will also generate some type of displacement. So in a sense, getting the contract or getting a position is kind of like a zero sum game. So, so people might think that if I am not bribing, then you know, I'm not, uh, I mean, I, I will be unfairly yeah. losing to, to, the, to the others who are, who are using bribes. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, I saw that I did a study many years ago about, uh, um, you know, in Italy, there was this big scandal, Bribesville, where entire political parties were wiped out. And uh, exactly uh, one thing that happened when uh, you listen, uh, I, I had the fortune of looking at the documents of the trials. And uh, all these managers were saying, first of all, everybody did it as if it is a justification because it was illegal. But the interesting thing is you could not get a contract if you don't engage, you know, in bribing, kickbacks, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yes, of course, 
uh, you know, uh, it, it may be the case. In our example, instead it was a little bit, uh, bit different because, uh, you know, if I tell you in this particular place, most people um, agree that one should bribe, uh, let's say, coll college officers. And normally they would say, oh, if they agree they should, then they do. But this didn't happen. And it didn't happen, I think, because people really know that it is not that frequent because it costs a lot of money. Because on newspaper, it went between $200,000 and $500,000. And how many people have that amount of money? Very few. Okay. And so this is one example of an outlier. Okay, in which that can be easily explained by the fact that people know that this behavior can't be that frequent. Okay, just as an example. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have no further questions. So thank you again, Christina. It has been a wonderful and enlightening talk. And yeah, oh, sorry, there are two more questions. I'm not sure oh. whether we have the time. Oh, or not. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I did. I, I missed them. Yeah. I, I, I do think we, we have time for those. So uh, Krutash says, hello, thank you for the amazing talk on the debate regarding the role of the government to establish trust in science. How about the fact that the people do not trust the governments anymore? Uh, this is an interesting result that we got. I didn't show it to you because it was not a discussion about that paper. But with people with low expectation, so people who don't think most people, you know, respect distance, uh, staying home, etc., and don't think uh, that even people approve of that, uh, the higher their trust in government, the better their behavior. Okay, not trusting science has really no effect on these people. Okay, but trusting government does, we show that. Now, the interesting thing is uh, that uh, when you have all this instead high expectation, okay, and low trust in science, what happens? What happens is called free riding. <laughs> if I believe that most people, okay, behave well, my misbehavior, first of all, is a drop in the ocean, <laughs> okay? And on top of that, I do not believe what scientists say. So my risk is really low. And so this is, you know, an invitation for opportunistic behavior. What else was in the question? Uh, in, go in government? Yes. So, so on, on the debate on the role of government establishing trust in science, how about the fact that people do not trust the government okay. anymore? Uh, well, um, again, even if there is a low trust in government, if there is high trust in science, the result will be uh, much better, okay? Even if there is a low trust in government. And I show that in the slide. You know, the trust in government is not very important if you have high normative, high empirical expectation and trust in science. Trust in government is really irrelevant. It becomes very relevant with low expectation. So if you don't trust government and you have low expectation, you are in trouble. And there are some countries um, in Latin America that you see an enormous difference between China, where trust in government is super high and trust in science is super high. And uh, we have- and other, and other countries which are, <laughs> where it is very low. Uh, I think that Diego, yes. yeah, I think that we... we lost Diego. <laughs> Diego? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, no, yes. You were freezing. You are freezing, I think. I can. Oh. Okay. I'm sorry. I... Okay. Let me let me cut my camera. Yeah, but. Uh, by uh, Santiago Borda, science in general, or behind the example of Dr. Fauci as a trust scientist in. 
Uh, I didn't hear let, well the question. Let, let me take the, the, let me replace Diego. So Santiago Borda asks, should we try to improve trust in science as general, as a general denomination or in scientists? It comes into my mind, the example of doc, Dr. Fauci as a trusted scientist. Uh, uh, that's a, um, a very good question. Uh, we talk in this, uh, in this paper of trust in science uh, as sort of equivalent uh, to trust uh, in scientists. Uh, in general, uh, you know, what people hear on television, et cetera, is scientists, doctors in this case, uh, talking about uh, what to do or what not to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, science is a more abstract concept. <laughs> you know, you hear a physicist saying something about uh, black holes, okay? Uh, it's not, you trust uh, what the physicist says because, uh, you know, it is a, a sort of representative of his or her group. So trust in science is very much related to trust in scientists because the science message is usually conveyed to the large majority of people through scientists that come on television, et cetera. Uh, you know, I don't know how many people read science journals. The majority of people watch television and look at Dr. Fauci, let's say, on television. And so trust in science and trust in scientists is somewhat related because of that. We, we have a, if you can hear me, we have another question from, from Manu Munoz. Uh, when the reference group is persistent in following detrimental behavior, have you looked at cases where instead of motivating change to the reference group, individuals are influenced to change their reference group? Um, yes, uh, uh, this, uh, this happens. Actually, um, when we do network analysis, okay, we always do, when I work on social norm, I always do network analysis. It's very important to understand, uh, uh, you know, the reference network of people that follow a particular rule, let's say. And um, sometimes people can vote with their feet, as we say, and really leave the group uh, and form a completely different group. Uh, think of communities like the Amish. They have left their, <laughs> their greater network and uh, you know, found their small little network. And this is, um, I discussed this uh, in, uh, in my late book, Norm in the Wild, when I talk about uh, trendsetter and networks. Uh, basically, sometimes, it is possible to leave the larger group and form your own small group. This has been done in India very successfully with uh, uh, communities that wanted to abandon child marriage and they form their own small community. So they leave the larger network, they form their own network and they marry, intermarry their children, you know, at a later age. So this can be done, but not always. Sometimes you, re you really cannot, uh, you know, change your network, cannot abandon it. And in this case, it becomes, you know, much more difficult, but it can be done. Well, thank you very much, Christina. I think that's all the questions we have for now. So uh, I would ask everyone to give you a big round of applause, but we'll not be able to hear it. I'm sure everyone is doing that right now. Uh, now I think Mariana will give us some uh, logistical details as, regarding the rest of the, of the conference today. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Christina. It was a great, a great talk. So I'm, uh, I want to ask everyone to bear with us. I'm going to paste here in the chat, the link that you have to use to attend the contributed sessions. And the way I want to tell you, like the way we are going to handle the contributed sessions is that each speaker is going to have uh, from 25 minutes to 30 minutes um, for uh, his or her presentation. And then and the moderator, I'm going to be moderating the first session. The moderator will have 
uh, will handle the clarifying questions through the chat. And then we will open the floor where you are going to be able to ask direct questions to the speaker. And then when we have coffee breaks, uh, the idea is that we are going to provide two different um, Zoom meeting links uh, so people can meet with each of, of the speakers of the previous session, uh, just for socializing and also to extend the feedback regarding the speaker's presentation. So we know it's not a um, perfect substitute for a real coffee break or a real lunch break, but we wanted to replicate um, in-person interaction as much as possible. So please, if we all switch to the, to the other link that I uh, that I pasted in the in the chat, uh, so we are able to follow with uh, today's activity. And thank you very much once again, Christina, and for the attendees also for being here. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you. And have a nice continuation. Thank you, Christina. Bye bye. bye.